Um, hello and welcome to the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program's Homeowner Webinar Series. My name is Jen Marvin and I'm the Florida Yards Neighborhood Statewide Coordinator. Today we have Jim Davis speaking about gardening for birds. Your microphones have been muted. If you have questions, please type them into the chat box and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. Stick around until the end of the presentation to take the survey that will pop up. It helps me give you the kind of programming you like and lets us know how we're doing. Our next presentation will be the third Tuesday in February at 11 a.m. And we will be talking about toxic plants with Chris Marble. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Jim. Uh, Jim is a multi-county extension director for UF IFAS Extension Sumter and Hernando counties. He has been in extension for over 15 years with programs areas, including agriculture, natural resources and urban pest management. He previously served as the Florida Yards Neighborhoods Agent, Residential Horticulture Agent and Master Gardener Coordinator in Sumter County. Jim's program areas have been recognized on the international and national levels. He was recently awarded the Distinguished Service Award from the National Association of County Agricultural Agents and Florida Association of County Agricultural Agents. He is a native Floridian, avid hiker, and wildlife photographer. It's my pleasure to turn the floor over to Jim Davis. Well, thank you, Jennifer and, uh, and Emily, and welcome everyone on this uh, beautiful, brisk day. And uh, so I'm in Sumter County today. So I was very happy to see some of our Sumter County residents and Hernando County residents. So today we're going to talk about landscaping for birds or gardening for birds. and and uh, you know, birding, um, I was talking to Jennifer, I've really just started to appreciate the value of birds. I've been a photographer for a while, always appreciated wildlife for a very long time, took a lot of pictures of them, but birds have, um, are, are very, a, a fascination for me. So there's some methods that we're going to teach you today. Hopefully we can teach you some methods to attract these birds to your landscape. And, and it really is not hard. You know, if you follow a couple of these methods, um, some of the things that we're going to teach you, um, you're going to attract some birds. OK, so some of the um, some of the so here's the objectives that we're going to go through this presentation. It's a lot today and I'm going to give my email at the end. And if you want the uh, a copy of this presentation, um, I'll send it to, to Jennifer, Emily or however you want to do it. So you all can have a copy, a PDF copy of this. Um, so. First of all, we're going to learn why birds are important, uh, some necessary inquire, requirements to attract birds. I'm going to go through some of the landscape plants. These are some of my favorite landscape plants to attract um, birds into your landscape. So these are going to be your trees, shrubs, and perennials. Talk a little about some snags, cavities, and brush piles and why they're important. Um, the landscaping itself, vertical layering is is essential in any landscape, any Florida friendly landscape aesthetically, it's good to create vertical layering in the landscape. Uh, I'm gonna touch briefly about bird feeders uh, and some bird houses, and we're gonna end up with some bird ID. Um, in order to garden for birds or landscape for birds, you have to know the birds. And um, it's just like knowing what kind of butterflies they have in the landscape. So you have to know your birds and what's out there. So we're gonna cover some basic ones because good observation um, leads to learning their behavior and what they do, where they live in the landscape. So that way you know what to plant, okay? So this is, a, first of all, before we get started, this is one of my favorite, one of my favorite quotes about birds. It says, everyone likes birds. What wild creature is more accessible to our eyes and ears as close to us and everyone in the world as universal as a bird. And as a wildlife photographer, you know, I have all the animals that I see on a frequent basis as birds. So that's why I kind of appreciate them um, a lot. And so this is a little green heron for my Sumter County residents. This is at Finney Springs. So why are birds, why are birds important? Okay. And first of all, they're part of our web in our ecosystems. Birds are critical in maintaining populations, whether it be amphibians, reptiles, rodents. 
but they're also prey for other animals. They're prey for other birds. They're prey for reptiles and mammals and so on. So here you have a, a great egret eating a garter snake. I love snakes. I love garter snakes. This is a circle of life. This is a balance. Can you imagine a world without birds? Okay. So they're incredibly important for the ecosystem. Pest control. These are Mother Nature's pest control. Okay. And so you have different, here you have a mockingbird eating, I believe that's a wolf spider. And uh, so active in keeping pests down, not only in landscape settings, but also agricultural settings. Agricultural settings, they're very important. Bluebirds are very important for keeping certain pest species down. Other birds are very important for keeping, keeping caterpillar populations under control in agricultural settings under certain crops. And you know, also rodents, you know, uh, and tracking birds. We always like to attract the songbirds, but what about our raptors? Okay, and our raptors are again, and like an apex predator in the bird world. They're very important. So rodents are, are favored prey for raptors, owls, hawks, and so on. You know, rodents they not only cause structural problems inside the house, but also agriculturally as well. Okay, so over a lifetime, here's some stats. Um, I believe this is by um, um, Purdue. Is over a lifetime, a barn owl eats approximately about 11,000 mice. Just one barn owl, okay? So birds feed on a variety of pests, insects, and agriculture. Um, most woody tree species, about 92% are dispersed by birds as far as the seeds and so on. Uh, that includes 85 timber species, 182 edible plants, 153 medicinal plants, and 146 ornamental species. And here you have a brown thrasher. This is a mulberry bush, you know? And so he's gonna, he or she is gonna eat this mulberry bush and they're gonna go poop and disperse the seeds probably somewhere else if that's, if that's a fertile, um, fertile, fertile plant. Then you have, you know, seed dispersal, you have nutrient recycling. So bird poop, you know, guano, you know, feathers decaying, improving soil quality, okay? Um, waste removal. Well, uh, waste removal is pretty, pretty interesting. And you have certain birds in the landscape that are critical for this. Um, I don't know, nobody's gonna be attracting vultures to the yard, but vultures are a very important species of bird. They're made in the Mother Nature's cleanup crew, preventing the spread of certain diseases such as rabies and other things. And they help the keep a clean environment. So birds are incredibly important. We'll talk about birding a little later. Birding is probably one of the most popular hobbies there is. It's a billion dollar industry. And uh, I think it's around 40 to 45 million people um, actively are wildlife viewers and, and birders in the US. It's, it's just incredible how much people spend on this, on this hobby. Some necessary requirements um, to attract birds in your landscape. As master gardeners, you, you already know this. As homeowners, um, some of this may be due, some, may, some of it may be not. Obviously, you have to have these three basic things, okay? Water. You have to have water in the landscape to attract um, and keep birds in the landscape. Now, you don't have to have water in your yard. They're probably going to find it in your neighbors or somewhere else. But if you have a bird bath, for example, in your yard, that makes a great place for these birds to bathe in, makes great photography moments and just observation. I mean, look at this bird on the right. It's just fun watching them bathe. They're just really, really interesting. Um, they have fun. They have fun in doing it. Food, shelter, and much more. We're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about all those and a little bit much more, okay, as far as what you can do as a homeowner to attract these, these feathered friends. Is any, the, any wildlife, okay, this not only counts for birds, but butterflies and mammals and so on. There's some basic top, tens, pot, top 10 tips for success. Limit the amount of lawn is good. Um, I'm not anti-lawn by any means, uh, but limiting the amount and maybe putting more native plants or plants that attract pollinators or birds will definitely improve that habitat. Most guaranteed to do that. 
increased vertical layering. I'm going to show you that a little later. And some snags and brush piles, um, plant native vegetation. Um, I, for attracting wildlife, I kind of prefer native plants. For this, you don't have to have all native plants to attract birds in your landscape. I'm going to show you some non natives that are perfectly fine that birds use things for. But the native plants offer a lot of benefits. First of all, they're when planted in the right place, okay? Native plant is suited to that specific location. They provide shelter, they provide cover, and some of them provide food. And I'm gonna show you some great native plants um, that I really like that we have in our demonstration garden here in Sumter that the birds just gravitate to. Provide bird, um, bird bat houses, bird feeders, and so on. Um, you wanna remove any invasive exotic plants in the landscape because some of these plants can hybridize. Not, they can only take over like Mexican petunia, um, but some plants such as some lantana will actually hybridize with native lantana. Um, so you really wanna learn your invasive plants um, with this webinar series throughout the year, if you're new to this, um, I'm sure they're gonna have some information on invasive species and so on. Learn about your native invasive species, and learn how to get rid of them. Manage pets. We're gonna talk about a little bit about that a little later, specifically um, cats. Um, reduce your pesticide use, definitely. Oh, manage pests appropriately, one of our Florida friendly principles. Um, you don't have to nuke your landscape, okay? So just only remove, only use when needed. And I always tell people, if you're spending a lot of money using pesticide on plants, why have the plant? Choose another plant. And expand the scale of habitat. That's very, very important. Not only in your own yard, but maybe about your community. So there's so much fragmentation going on in developments. Fragmentation is basically you have these little islands, right? You, you, know, you may have a great habitat, but your neighbors may not. You want like a little corridor where wildlife can go from one place to another. That is ideal in a, in a community. Um, that's what you really, really want to strive to happen is expand the scale of habitat, okay? So, um, and like I said, you know, grass and open areas is perfectly fine. You don't have to have everything shrubs and, and trees. Just want to get that across. But uh, open area is fine. Some birds love this. Bluebirds love an open area. This is how they hunt. Ibises, this is how they, this is how they feed. This is Bahia grass. This is a flag pond that temporarily gets flooded. These type of areas are fine. So um, having these open areas is, is very important. So let's talk about some of the water and specifically bird baths. We're gonna start with bird baths. Now, most birds drink every day and they also need water to bathe. Aside from cleaning feathers and cooling off during a hot day, bathing also removes any parasites on the bird. Now, I don't know if y'all remember, um, they probably still have them, these old school concrete bird baths. Now I work in a garden center a long time ago, um, and we had these remember, concrete bird baths that were very, very deep. It had a big slope on them. That's not the ideal bird baths. <laughs> They're usually too deep. They're hard to clean because of the pores and everything, they get algae and stuff in there, and they're just hard to clean. Uh, not the best for our little feathered friends. You wanna look for one with a gentle slope so the birds can wade in, okay? That's critical. They're gonna land on the edge, you know, and they're gonna, they're gonna wade in. So here's one, I just took a picture of one of the department stores that I actually kind of like. This is probably no more than maybe an inch deep, but you see the ridges on the side. This is great for birds to wade in, grab a hold of, so they're not gonna slip, you know, and fall in. They need, they need something to stand on. You know, you can put sand in there and you can put um, maybe some um, little tree limbs or whatever for the plant, for the bird to walk around and to help it, uh, or uh, stones work also very well and maybe put some small rocks in the middle, okay? The water shouldn't, you know, be no deeper than a half an inch and one inch in the edges, sloping to a maximum of about two inches deep in the middle, okay? No, no deeper than that. And like I said, it, it's, it's good to have a, a bird bath that, that 
whenever the bird wades in, they're not going to slip. It's so it shouldn't be really, really smooth. Um, ideally, in an ideal world, birds actually prefer um, bird mass at ground level. But predators um, are a problem in communities. So if you're going to raise it, you know, two to three feet up is fine. And, and those birds will actively use this, um, use this bird bath. You want to keep it near shade so the water doesn't get hot and it stays cleaner for a longer amount of time. Okay. It, it also offers that bird protection. And this is something I'm going to talk about quite frequently. Birds flutter, they go back and forth. They need protection. And so if you have this bird bath in the middle of a sunny yard in the front, uh, well, then he can be, you know, something go after him, other birds for peregrine falcon or whatever, you know, after him, another hawk or something like that. So if you have this bird bath near the shade, um, you're going to have trees near. And so that bird can go and find some cover. Clean weekly. Maybe you want to use a slight solution of bleach. They have some concoctions online. Uh, one of the, my favorite resources is Cornell, uh, Lab of Ornithology, all about birds, okay? All about birds, Cornell. It's a wonderful site. That's my go-to. And um, you can actively clean these bird baths. And, you know, a lot of people are, con are concerned with mosquitoes because we talk about mosquitoes in my, my webinar series and the diseases they carry. But if you clean that bird bath weekly, you're going to be fine. Okay, um, you're going to be good to go. Um, so just clean it weekly, maybe maybe four to five days. You don't have to worry about that, and uh, keep that water clean for your bird. Just think of it. You want is that water? Is that water going to be good for you to drink? Okay, don't give your birds dirty water. Okay, don't pour chlorine all in there and this other stuff. So. Um, if it's good for you to drink, it's going to be good for your birds. Water ponds and, and water fountains are great. In fact, if you have a, like a little uh, bird bath with a little fountain in the middle, um, that's awesome. Birds love the sound of running water. They're going to love that. Um, they absolutely love the sound of running water. This is a nice pond. It's actually from one of our master gardeners in Sumter County. So I took this a little, uh, several years ago, uh, Pat Provence. And uh, she has a beautiful fountain in her backyard, a uh, little nice bird feeder there and, you know, the birds and wildlife can go to. And you can see it's really not that deep, has a lot of vegetation, a lot of cover, a lot of things for the birds to stand on. This is very well done, okay, for a little pond. Um, you don't want to have a really deep pond because that's not going to offer anything for your birds unless you have a gradual slope on one side or whatever. Yeah, like I said, use natural vegetation for perching and protection. Um, any nesting structures would be great. Uh, now this is now for pond ponds. Some of us are who may be lucky to live next to a retention pond or a true, true pond. Um, you wanna use the Florida friendly principles, avoid mowing near that littoral zone. Um, you avoid using pesticides around, avoid any leaching or getting into that water. That's, that's number one. Um, but plant some vegetation on the side if you can. For example, this is pickerel weed, right? Great, awesome for pollinators, awesome for birds as well. But you know, this is one of my pet peeves to see a, a true pond. And this is one of my lakes that's near me that I photograph in. This is one part of the lake that is ugly. And you have grass right next to it and no, no buffer zone. This is terrible. Okay, one little plant. Okay, in the same pond down the way, you have all the sorts of vegetation. And guess what? This is where all the birds are, go figure. And so whenever, where you, whenever you have this, all this vegetation around the pond, it's going to offer cover uh, for the birds. They're going to use it for nesting. They're going to use it to rest during the day to feed. In this area, as you have red-winged blackbirds, nesting in the center, you won't even see them until they start to flock, until they start to flock out. Um, but it also creates a little microhabitat for the small invertebrates in the water, maybe some of the fish, amphibians, this whole little microhabitat. This is, this is like a little nursery. It's very important and uh, for, for life. 
And so if you have this, you're going to have birds, you're going to have a great habitat. So the more vegetation you can plant on the side, the better, okay? The better for the birds. And you're going to get a whole host of different birds using this area if you landscape it well. So birds need shelter. And in shelter, they can, you can provide that shelter and food by planting the appropriate plants. And okay, so they need it to, to, to feed, to rest, to nest. Um, the use of trees are very important for birds such as red-shouldered hawks and barred owls, woodpeckers, and a multitude of songbirds. Um, trees offer nesting opportunities for cavity nesting birds such as red-bellied woodpeckers or you know, great crested gnat catchers or eastern bluebirds. And shrubs also um, not only um, shrubs also offer protection not only in people's yards, but also near water. Um, so I can't stress that enough if you have a pond. Shrubs are very important in a landscape for birds. Incredibly important because this is where the birds, this is this is where the Carolina wrens, the the red birds, the um, uh, gray cat birds, all these cool songbirds, this is where they're going to hide. You're probably not even going to see them in the shrubs. You're going to hear them, but you won't, won't see them. They actively use these shrubs. Okay. So this is why we're going to talk about vertical layering of the layer, uh, of the layer. And this is kind of, this is kind of a little minor example of vertical layering um, where you have these, you know, you may have a transition of, of plants that are one foot high up to three foot and then a tree. That's a layer, right? So here you have a weeping yo pond surrounded with some walters by burnum and some grasses. This is great. You know, birds are gonna use this for nesting. Uh, they're gonna use this to hide and so on. And, um, you know, if you plant some shrubs in there to offer some food, that's gonna be even better, okay? Grasses are great. I'm not gonna talk, go too much into grasses on this one, but muley grass, love grass, any of the native grasses that offer seeds are wonderful for our seed feeding birds. And if you're one of these lucky individuals um, who get our um, winter residents, our painted buntings, you know, this is what they like to eat, okay? Our seeds, that's their primary diet. Bird houses are excellent to provide home for birds as well. And, uh, you know, we'll look at some of the, I'll show you some of the bird houses um, a little later on. So that's a great custom gnat catcher. Uh, that I was talking that's really critical for using this bird loves the cavities using cavity this is a cavity nester and uh, just a wonderful awesome looking bird and of course this is our love this is a love grass that we have in our demo garden demo garden um, that can be used for birds birds as well this is a native species easy to grow okay so whenever you're doing landscape design it's good to use different um, different shapes so prior to selecting a tree or shrub, you know, make sure you know the form or texture. Uh, weeping or spreading forms make nice focal points in the landscape, but require a lot of room, okay? Uh, weeping yopon requires a lot of room. <laughs> um, just make sure you plant it in the right place. Um, olive or columnar trees look beautiful in formal gardens, but will not provide an abundance of shade. Notice the texture. Magnolia leaves are large and coarse, while bottle brush have small thin leaves. Uh, it's an also important, to, whether it's deciduous or evergreen. In order to have a, a well landscape garden for birds, you have to have conifers or evergreens. And I'm gonna show you a couple, okay? You don't want all plants that are deciduous. You want some evergreens in there for protection, okay? And, uh, so use these different types of textures uh, and forms, and that makes a aesthetically looking landscape. Okay. Now let's talk about some of the some of the plants that you can actively plant uh, in your landscape to attract some of these birds. And I have to put this in uh, is a live oak. Uh, to me, there's no tree out there better to attract wildlife than a live oak. Um, I have yet to see one. A live oak is wonderful. And we have a lot of other oaks, turkey oaks and shumart oaks and so on. But live oaks are just fantastic to attract wildlife. You're not only going to have, you know, you can have raccoons in this and you're going to have squirrels and fox squirrels and insects and, you know, spiders and so on. But birds are really going to use these large oaks. Large oaks are very important 
um, for habitat, for bird habitat in a community. If you don't have large oaks in your community, um, you're not gonna have as many birds, simple as that. You, know, you may have some, but you're not gonna have as many as a development that has these large oaks. And with my development, I live in an area much like the villages in Sumter County, um, but we have predominantly these large oaks. And of course, I see a lo little bit more different, more bird species and a wide variety of bird species than to do in a newly developed area. So it takes some time to build up to that point, but these live oaks are wonderful. Red-shouldered hawks will use this to nest. Um, great horn owls, barred owls. Um, um, you may even get swallowtail kites nesting in it. But you notice one of the things that's hanging down from this is a Spanish moss. Spanish moss typically grows on a lot of plants, but predominantly live oaks. And Spanish moss is one of the most important nesting materials for birds, like the ones I just named, you know, red shoulders and swallowtails and so on. They depend on this moss for nest. Bats even roost in it. So if you have the room, if you have the opportunity to plant a live oak, that is one of the best, best ones to do. Very high resistant, just amazing plant for wildlife, okay? Avoid using the shorter lived oaks. Magnolia. Um, magnolias are wonderful too. You know, they're a beautiful plant, beautiful flower. This great, this offers a great nesting and protection um, for birds. So this is in our demo garden. We've had uh, two or uh, several mockingbird nests in this um, where they hatched out and the juveniles were fluttering around the plant. And it's so thick in there, you really couldn't tell there was a nest, which is good, it offers protection. But this is also a transition point um, from, this, from this layering because you know we have grasses on the bottom, we have perennials, we have an open field in the back. So this is used by different types of birds. Um, again, the gnat catchers, maybe you get some kestrels per perching on there or whatever. Um, so it's, it's a great plant for these birds who like to perch and nest, okay? Doesn't really offer too much, any, I don't think any food source for the bird, but again, great for cover and, uh, and so on. Now this is a, this is a semi deciduous, is always dropping leaves. So just keep that in mind. They do have a dwarf, which is little Jim, which I think it's about 30, 40 foot. So again, you have to give it a plant that you have to give it some, some room. Some of the plants that are underutilized in landscapes are pines. Uh, now we had, do have some master gardeners in the villages that plant, plant that had plant planted pines in the villages and they look fantastic. If you have the opportunity to plant pines, go for it, especially long leaves. Swallowtail kites will nest in them uh, with mature pine trees. You have a whole bunch of different per birds perching and using this as protection. This is probably one of the most used plants in our demo garden for birds by far. And um, I see everything in these pines. And what they do is they just perch. Sometimes they get insects on the tree. Um, uh, we get these sawfly larvae sometimes on the tree. So they'll feed on that. And you know, these perchers, they'll, they, like, they, they dive down and catch and bugs and stuff like that. So, you know, this is, this is what you typically see. You know, you may see a hummingbird perched on there. This is, this is from that pine tree, by the way. And, uh, same thing, same birds on the same pine tree. And so you have a blue jay, a blue jay is eating some fruit or whatever he has on there trying to crack and are using these uh, limbs to eat on. So um, excellent. And for all, you also have different birds um, that will feed on these pine seeds, um, these pine warblers and so on, beautiful yellow bird. So if you have the opportunity in the room Longleaf pine, slash pine, loblolly pine, sand pine, whatever. Um, highly encourage that. Something a little bit smaller in your landscape. Uh, Fajoa pineapple guava is good. The bird eat, eats the fruit from this. I really love this plant because it's silver green. It's evergreen, okay? It's evergreen, looks fantastic. This makes year, year round cover. Look how thick it is. Year round cover for birds. This is great to hide from predators, okay? This is an easy plant, drought tolerant. It's one of my favorite plants to grow um, by far, um, is the uh, Fajoa or pineapple guava. 
Moving on, we have almond bush, Aloysia. Um, my master gardeners know that I love this plant. It smells good. It grows really fast, really big, so give it some room. Uh, it's great for nesting. We've had set, we have a brown thrasher uh, nest in uh, the tree, I think, this year. Um, they continually use the tree for nesting, so it makes great nesting habitat, but it also attracts a lot of pollinators, a lot of bees, um, wasp, and flies, and so on. And so just think about that. So it's attracting all these insects. So you have some birds that are frugivores, fruit loving birds. You have some birds that are insectivores and they switch diets. For example, a mockingbird typically is more, will be more of an insectivore in the summertime and will switch diets and be more of a frugivore in the wintertime. Okay. And so these insectivores will actively, you know, they'll go after these bugs on these plants. And uh, so, not only creating a habitat for pollinators, but also food for, uh, for our birds. Now, believe it or not, Japanese privets very good. <laughs> and uh, some people may scoff at this, um, but this is my Japanese privet in my yard. Um, and it is, I always have birds in this plant, always, always. In fact, I, was, I heard this one this morning was a cardinal. I have several cardinals and Carolina wrens. And there'll be three or four in this tree. And, it, and it's really hard to see them in there um, unless you go on, up under the canopy. So, you know, yes, the Japanese privet, this is a non-native plant, doesn't really offer any food source for the bird, but great for nesting, great for cover from predators, okay? Crepe myrtle's the same thing. Great for nesting birds. Here's one that nested in our crepe myrtles in our yard. Here's a hummingbird that perched on our crepe myrtle. And I'll show you why it was doing that. But yeah, you know, crepe myrtles are wonderful for, for perching for nesting birds. Absolutely. Nothing for food, but great for, great for nesting and cover. But just keep in mind, these are deciduous and different crepe myrtles grow different sizes. So make sure you choose the right one. Eastern red buds, these are great as well. Just a beautiful plant. This is a Lake County extension. When I took this um, in their parking lot, uh, years ago. Wonderful plant, great for again nesting and for, for birds as well. So eastern red bud uh, is fairly easy to grow here in central Florida. North Florida gets a little easier. South Florida maybe a little bit harder. Nellie Stevens. Um, now this is an evergreen. Now you have Nellie Stevens, you have East Plaque, a holly is fine. Um, any evergreen holly is going to be good because the birds are going to use this to eat, they're going to eat the berries. They're going to use it for cover. As we all know, hollies, some of the leaves on hollies are very prickly. So this again offers wonderful protection. You know, drought tolerant plant produces some berries, evergreen. It's a no brainer to me as far as why you can't plant this in the landscape to attract wildlife. Birds love this plant. They will actively use this plant. Um, so any of the hollies are going to be just fine. Out of all the hollies out there, I kind of prefer this one. And there's several varieties. There's a dwarf, there's a standard, and there's a weeping. And this is Yopon holly. And you know, hollies, now hollies are just um, dioecious. So there's males and females, only the females have the berries. So make sure you buy one that has the berries on it if you want the birds to eat the fruit. So, um, but the weeping, we have a weeping, um, this is a colony cottage in the villages, but we have a weeping right here in our demo garden that's huge. And, and there's birds all over it, nesting, perching on top, you know, house finches, whatever, uh, cardinals. It's just an outstanding wildlife plant. Weeping plants look good on the corners of your house, okay? Uh, not in front of your house. They look good on the corners as a focal point, as a transition. Uh, but, you know, you could have your dwarf yopons in the front. And there's another standard, which looks like a large shrub um, that looks pretty, too, that I have at my folks' property that the wildlife like the nest in as well. So, again, this is one of the easiest plants to grow. I always tell people, if you can't grow this plant, move into a condominium and, you know, give up landscaping. To me, this is the easiest plant to grow. Drought tolerant, cold tolerant evergreen, doesn't lose leaves. Um, I don't think any has any of them has pest problems and attracts wildlife. What more can you want in a plant? 
okay? Or is it Yo Pond Holly? Cabbage palm, there's a lot of palms out there. I'm a palm person, um, but you will not find a palm that attracts more wildlife than a sable palm. This is a very important palm in Florida and for wildlife. For mammals such as raccoons, when, so here you have the inflorescence uh, that's flowering out that's great for pollinators, bees, and stuff like that. Um, flies and beetles. And then whenever it fruits out, then you get the birds. And so whenever, this, whenever these palms start to bury out, uh, if I'm at a nature area, I kind of gravitate towards that because I know the birds are feeding on it. And I'll sit and wait. And that's what bird watching is, is sitting and waiting. <laughs> and uh, they may go away, but if you stand still, they're going to come back and you can view them. So in one area, I was seeing one palm now. I was seeing robins, cedar wax wings, um, red-bellied woodpeckers will, will feed on this plant. Um, a whole bunch of different um, birds will utilize this, um, will utilize this species. They not only feed on it, but again, your red-bellied woodpeckers will use this plant to crack open the fruit or whatever. They'll use this and you can hear it actually knocking um, on the bark, on the wood there. Uh, so the red-bellied woodpeckers will actually hide the food in the palm boots. Um, you'll see them do that. Again, observation, right? You get to learn their behavior and what they're doing. So sable palms, wonderful plant, easy to grow. Um, Highly recommend of all the palms that, that we plant here, this is one of my favorites, um, is the sable palm or cabbage palm. They're very long-lived palms. Palm like this could be 100 years old, you never know. Um, but again, an excellent, excellent wildlife palm. And of course, then you have, you can have vertical layering with palm trees. You can have coon teas, you can have saw palmetto, you have sable palms. So the saw palmetto is a medium level plant. Uh, this is in the villages at Colony Cottage. This is a silver. This is a green. Silver is kind of native to the East Coast. I like to use this a lot because silver pops in the landscape. Use it on the corners of your house. Uh, it'll grow like this big in a, probably about, uh, I don't know, five to seven years is what ours did in the demo garden. But what makes this plant important, of course, it does have the fruit, which animals do utilize but it offers a lot of protection for birds because it's a, it's a clumping plant with uh, serrated petioles. Um, so again, offers a lot of protection, protection. If I took you hiking in a natural area, you can see all sorts of birds in here. Um, you could see yellow throat warblers um, and, and you know, a whole host of different types of birds going in and out of these plants for protection. And so it's all about protection, protecting these birds from going one, from one area to another. This is what they're going to utilize these medium level plants for. Bottle brush is another good one. Hummingbirds will actually visit this plant. Um, great for nesting. This is one, I, one of the ones I have on my folks' property. Very long lived plant, drought tolerant. This one survived, this one is underwater for like three months. It's going to tolerate saturated conditions. Um, cold. Some are cold tolerant. You also have a weeping form. Uh, but again, it, 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 we have, my neighbor has one of the hummingbirds, our Ruby 30 hummingbird visit all the time. So um, another great plant for medium to tall level in your landscape for, to utilize for, to attract some of the birds, but also for nesting. The more nesting materials you put out for your landscape, the more you get to keep and draw these birds in. Dwarf Walter's viburnum, another medium level plant that you can use in vertical layering. Um, again, great for nesting birds, kind of flowers in the winter time, um, maybe winter, late winter, and uh, just an awesome plant, low maintenance. You'll see it in the developments all the time. One of my favorites. And an American Beautyberry, here's uh, one of my favorite shows because it offers food, okay, berries. They're not going to, birds are not, I don't think the birds are going to nest in this unless it's a very, very large beauty berry. Um, but the birds are really going to go after this, especially our frugivores, our fruit loving birds, such as mockingbirds. They're going to eat this up. <laughs> um, so this, this is a 
easy plant to grow in your landscape. You can maintain the control, you can maintain the size. It starts to flower in the spring. You'll start to get the berries in the, uh, August-ish. And then, you know, throughout the winter time, they do have an Alba or like Tia, a white one, but it's not as vigorous as the purple. I've had, I've had that one. Um, but the birds really love this. If you want birds coming and feeding on some plants in your landscape, come to this. Okay, we're going to talk about bird feeders in a few minutes. Um, I'm not a proponent of burning, putting bird feeders next to a house. Um, and I'll explain why later. I like to use the native plants to provide the food for our, our birds throughout the year. This is a must. And you can find it anywhere, easy to grow, um, just a wonderful plant, very aromatic leaves whenever you crush them, crush them up. Highly recommend this plant in your landscape, easy to take cuttings from and so on. Wax myrtle is another great plant, great for nesting. Whenever it has these myrtle berries come out in the winter time, birds are attracted to that. Our yellow rump warbler specifically, because they can digest these, they, they specifically eat on these. So whenever they they fruit out, you know, if I want to, you know, go someplace and wait and when these with the myrtle berries, maybe I'll get a chance to see some yellow rump warblers come and feed on these things. But another great plant that's easy to use in the landscape. Uh, leaves smell very good when crushed. Um, they have a dwarf wax myrtle and standard, but either way, this is another great plant to use for protection for nesting and food. This is, oh my gosh, I would say mm, beautyberry and probably this. Uh, I have a, a strong affinity to Florida privet because how long we've had it here in the demo garden, about 15 years. And so this is our privet in our front here. And this is our native species. If you want to replace viburnum, Japanese privet, which is invasive, sanicoa, viburnum, whatever, Replace it with this. This is fantastic. Makes a beautiful, it can make a beautiful manicured hedge. It can be informal, formal, however you want to do it, however high you want to trim it. Birds nest in this like crazy because it offers a lot of protection, but it has the fruit and the birds will feed on this. And we just have birds like this in this plant um, like crazy. It's this is one of my favorite wildlife plants. I say it over and over and over again. So if you want to attract birds, if you want to, if I was to have probably, you know, three plants, I do Japanese honeysuckle, excuse me, not Japanese honeysuckle, that's invasive, what am I saying? Coral honeysuckle, uh, Florida privet, and um, American beautyberry. Those would be my three baseline plants, okay? Cherokee bean is another cool plant, has interesting leaves to it, has red tubular um, flowers. It's actually a deciduous plant, then it'll flower out, then it'll get the leaves. This is great for hummingbirds. I'm not a proponent, I'm not a big proponent of hummingbird feeders. Um, I like to provide the plants for our hummers. And this is, aside from coral honeysuckle, this is another favorite that they will use. And Carolina jessamine, um, now this is a poisonous plant, so just keep that in mind but it offers a lot of protection and nesting for our songbirds, which this was in our demo garden at the time. It's not there anymore, um, but when it was, we had um, several nesting birds um, utilize this. And of course, coral honeysuckle. Um, couldn't ask for a better plant for our hummingbirds. Rufus hummingbirds, you know, you might get our mo more common ruby throaty hummingbird. Um, if you want hummingbirds, plant this plant. Drought tolerant, easy to grow, doesn't smell, but um, it, it's not an aggressive grower. Just, you know, give it some full sun if you can, maybe partial sun, really prefers full sun. Um, excellent for hummers. And of course, firebush is great for hummers and for protection as well. Um, so this is, you can get dwarf firebush, you can get Calusa, which is one of my favorites. You can get this uh, variegate, was it lime zinger or something like that? It's a yellowish one, very slow growing, or the native one, which gets very tall, very big. But it has these red tubular flowers that are great for sulfur butterflies, hummers, and also offers protection. A yellow anise, star anise, is another great evergreen shrub that you can plant for 
offer some protection and, and, and nesting for our uh, birds. Simpson Stopper is another one that offers the food, the shelter, this evergreen plant, and the cover. So we have several in our demo garden the birds use, and whenever they start bearing out, oh my gosh, the birds just, they feed on this like crazy. And our non-native podocarpus, sure. Podocarpus makes a great nesting habitat for birds. It's undeniable. Okay, it's a nice thick plant, can be trimmed informal, formal. You know, it's a pretty decent plant. But don't forget our flowering plants, which create our little micro habitat. So when landscaping for birds, do, um, do not ignore what animals that birds eat, especially arthropods, which include spiders, insects, caterpillars, they're all favorites. Plant the plants that attract those. By doing this, you also create micro habitats, improving our overall ecosystem. So rosin weed, beautiful native, these are all natives, okay? Rosin weed. Horse mint, tropical sage, dune sunflower, passion vine, gallardia, okay, or blanket flower. Very common, very easy to find. Absolutely beautiful plants. And like I said, uh, not only try butterflies, pollinators, but you know, it'll improve your bird habitat. So this is these are the plants in vertical layering that you're gonna plant probably at at the lowest end, then you're probably going to plant a shrub, medium level, and then a tree. So here I have some pictures of a of a resort I used to work in in Palm Beach that really we had very good vertical layering. And I'll show you some good examples. So you have you know maybe your annuals, maybe starting with your perennials, and then off your shrubs and your tall shrubs and your trees behind it. This is vertical layering. So a little transition, right? Now look at these. Look at look at this landscape. One of the things that I was taught. Um, by my boss, Lloyd Singleton, who's now an extension director in North Carolina, is Lloyd always taught me, whenever you look at a garden, you don't want to see mulch. <laughs> you want to have a nice, thick habitat, thick, thick landscape. Um, so this is what we always practice, and this is what I practice. And so here's another example of vertical layering. Start with some annuals, maybe some begonias, that's fine, whatever you want to put there, pentas, you know, um, you know, starting off to a hedge up here. This might be a ficus because this is in South Florida. But this again, you know, I have lion's ear, fire bush, maybe some annuals, but nice example of a, of a vertical layering. Say a good, beautiful, aesthetically looking <laughs> landscape. You know, some people's, people's, you know, some people like a jungle, some people like formal areas. It really doesn't matter whatever your personal tastes are. Um, but uh, this is a very attractive looking landscape while providing a lot of diversity. And this is, you know, in our demo garden, this is a commercial landscape. So, um, you know, again, vertical layering, this is Simpson stopper, crepe myrtle, that hummingbird was perched on the crepe myrtle because we have a salvia right here that he, was, that he or she, uh, it was a she, she was going and feeding on the salvia, jump on the crepe myrtle and then go away and then go on the crepe myrtle look around, feed, <laughs> and do that same thing. It'd be, you can almost time it, be like every like 20, 25 minutes. And so these small birds, these Carolina wrens and everything that we have use these uh, lower petalum, this Nandina uh, for, this is a sterile cultivar for protection. And of course this Simpson stopper for nesting and for food. So this little area right here is wonderful for birds. It's fantastic. So you don't, you don't really have to plant a lot. You just have to plant smartly and using the right plants, making sure you plant the right place and using all these Florida friendly principles. So some of the snags and cavities, um, you know, if you have the opportunity, uh, if, you, if you have the property to, if you can have a snag, which the snag is a dead tree, okay? Uh, any of these tree cavities, if you have a brush pile, that's great. Um, now I can't have a brush pile where I live. <laughs> On my folks' property, I can, um, and you know, snags can be a, a safety hazard, right? So, but if you have the five acres, four acres, you can have snags, uh, and and this is great for because a lot of insects live in this. This is a um, this is an immature red-headed woodpecker um, that was uh, you know was nesting in there, 
was uh, just emerged from its nest. This is a chinziget. And you know, different cavity nesting birds utilize this, these snags and cavities. So this is a pileated, um, or pileated, however you want to pronounce it, woodpecker. This is a little male and two little, two little ones in there while the, while the mom was going back and forth feeding them. So these snags, these cavities, and these cavities also occur on live trees as well, okay? Um, very, very important. Squirrels utilize them. This is one, this is in uh, next to my neighbor's house, cavity uh, up in the tree. And you can see in the hole here, this was taken with a not very good camera, but uh, this red-bellied woodpecker. So these red-bellied woodpeckers, these um, all these birds, these they dig these cavities out. And these cavities are very important, especially for birds who cannot make their own cavities, like bluebirds. That's why bluebird boxes are so important. Um, so anytime you have these cavities in the tree, they're they're awesome. They're great for different wildlife and birds. Okay, so snags, brush piles. If you can have that on your property it's going to attract a lot of stuff. And so these snags that you have, if you go to Chinsigit, you know, you'll get lucky and see our beautiful red-headed woodpecker um, that likes these upland areas that have a lot of snags, okay? Bird feeders. Uh, well, let's talk about bird feeders, squirrels and cats and so on. Whenever you have squirrels are gonna raid your bird feeder. There are some bird feeders now that are squirrel proof. They're gonna cost you about $50, $60, but they do work fairly well. They do have these, uh, the cones and these collars that go up on the pole, prevent the squirrels from climbing up. So there's ways to keep the squirrels out of there. If you have, a, now these bird feeders, you have hoppers, small hoppers, large hoppers. Um, you have these suet feeders. Um, you have these tube feeders. And then you have the, the 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 platform feeders, which is basically you know you know piece of wood and you put food on it, or you can put it on the ground. Platform feeder, everything's going to go to it. Um, suet feeders, there's a certain amount of birds species that will visit a suet suet feeder. This is a um, tufted titmouse. Uh, you also have Carolina wrens. You have uh, certain woodpeckers will go to this. Cardinals will go to suet feeders. So you can attract a lot of birds using these suet feeders. Um, but, you know, birds depend on different seed to eat, black oil sunflower seed, it could be safflower, it could be cracked corn. If you go onto the Cornell side of ornithology, it's called Nest Watch, you can actually go and find your bird and find what kind of birdhouse they like and what kind of bird seed, what bird feeder you should use and what kind of bird seed you, you should use. Um, so it makes it very, very easy. So this is a, this is a little Carolina wren. Uh, it's feeding on this little tube feeder. Um, but, you know, a lot of times you have to place your bird feeders up high, protect against predators. And now other bird, birds will predate on these, but, you know, cats, I'm a cat lover, I had cats all my life, okay? Um, love cats, but cats should be inside the house. Cats are one of the biggest killers of mammals and birds <laughs> by far, <laughs> um, unfortunately. So this is, um, this is by Cornell, okay? So cats kill an estimated 1.3 to 2.3 to 2 billion birds each year. Um, that's a lot of birds, that's a lot of birds. And so um, um, keep your cats indoors. And also one thing is don't, don't feed birds bread, for goodness sakes. That doesn't do a bird any good whatsoever. Uh, here you have a large tube feeder that is squirrel proof, okay? Squirrel cannot get in there. Uh, so this is utilized by a female cardinal, a little tough to tip mouse as well. Um, so there's, like I said, there's different seeding, there's mixes, there's seed that you can buy through Audubon Society um, and so on. Um, a lot of seed out there. Like I said, you can go on that nest watch, look, find the bird, mockingbird, for example, and it'll tell you, okay, it likes to feed on, um, you know, uh, I don't know, black oil sunflower seeds and it likes this large hopper or two feeder to feed on. But, you know, whenever you, if you do have these bird feeders, again, make sure you have these bird feeders located next to a tree or a large shrub. 
for their protection. They're not going to stay on this bird feeder and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. They're going to stay and eat and they're going to fly away. And they're going to come back and they're going to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So this is why it's necessary, to, if, if you want a good bird feeder, place it next to a shrub or a tree so these birds can have the protection that they need. Now, I was telling you all earlier, I don't, I'm not a big proponent of bird feeders next to houses. I will be putting some in our demo garden, probably, but I will never, never place a bird feeder next to my house because I'm an urban entomologist and I know rats will be attracted to the bird seed attracted to that. If, if you want to accept that and take the risk, go for it. Um, but there's a high probability you will get rats because it happened in my house and my neighbors. So I know for a fact that it does. Um, so, and they nested in my house, in my yard. So this is one of the reasons why I don't, next to a home dwelling, <laughs> in a demo garden, it's way out far, um, you know, my office, I'm not going to, I probably will put some bird feeders out there, but I know, understand it's a big hobby, great for photographers, you know, it's just personal preference, but I just rather plant the plants um, used to attract them. Now, there's different bird houses out there. Um, so features of, features of a good birdhouse, use untreated wood, galvanized screws, okay, sloped roof, recessed floor inside, a drainage, thick walls, about three quarters of an inch, ventilation holes, in the summertime it gets pretty hot, uh, or late spring, no perches. See how this one has a little perch? This is what you don't want. Birds don't need it. Okay, this will actually invite predators and other things to come in, so no perches. Um, rough interior walls inside, preferably, because the nestlings, they got to grab on something to climb out of the bots, especially for, you know, interior groups or bluebirds were great. A hinged door, so you can open it for, to clean it out, because you don't want paper wasp or, you know, something else being in there. Again, Cornell has a great resource for birdhouses. So does UF. Uh, Holly Ober has a wonderful publication um, through for birdhouses. Uh, teach you how to do it for a blue birdhouse. It's knowing your species and location, location, location. Okay. Uh, now in, in, in Sumter Hernando County, we're going to start building bird blue birdhouses this year. And as part of our classes, uh, we're going to be um, making these bluebird boxes as part of our class registration. So for, for y'all that live locally, look for that because we want to, the bluebird population was going south because of parasitism from, you know, other birds as cowbirds or, you know, European starlings or whatever. Um, you know, they have to compete with their cavity dwellers. They can't make their own nest. Once people start building the bird ho houses for bluebirds, their population started to increase. So this is, this is, we really want to build those blue those houses for our bluebirds. This is that Nest Watch. So this is going to tell you this is at Cornell at nestwatch.org. Different diameter, um, you know, gives you different uh, different bird species. So you can go on there and figure out what you need on that. Real quickly, I know we have a couple of minutes left. Um, know your birds. There's about 196 breeding bird species of birds in Florida. Uh, birding results in about 40 billion in direct economic activity in the US. Wildlife viewing is about a $5 billion industry in the Sunshine State. And like I said, observation is key. Um, so in other words, you know, here you have one of the most popular ones, a Northern Mockingbird. It's our Florida State bird, excellent songbird, okay? Very, can be very aggressive during mating season. Um, excellent to go after pests. Like I said, they're frugivores and insectivores. They like to feed on whole sunflower seeds. Mealworms are another fantastic for bluebirds, for mockingbirds and other birds. You can get these packages of mealworms at the, uh, you know, Lowe's Home Depot. Uh, they like platform and ground. Uh, they're really platform and ground feeder birds. Okay. Awesome birds. Wonderful to see in the landscape. Very easy to attract using a bird feeder. Blue jays are often seen as the bullies of a bird feeder, but actually they're really not. It's more like the redheaded uh, woodpeckers and so on. But uh, blue jays, again, another bird that you can easily attract to a bird feeder. They, you know, black oil sunflower seeds, cracked corn, mealworms, suet, you know, get a two feeder, a platform feeder, or a hopper. 
um, if you want to track these. They are the, uh, uh, the alarms of the neighborhood. So if you have a red shoulder hawk or great horned owl come in the area or predator, they're the first ones that are going to start um, making noise. And they actually mimic a red shoulder hawk almost perfectly. Okay. Uh, tough to tit mouse. This is very, very common bird, usually in group family groups. Uh, they feed on suet, fruit, any seeds, but they also feed on insects and spiders. Very focal bird. You notice they have this crest right here. Whenever that crest is raised on a lot of birds, that means they're alert or agitated. Whenever it's down, it's kind of they're, they're relaxed. Red-bellied woodpeckers are another one that you can do. You get some suet. Um, you can attract, even, they'll even go after, uh, go into um, um, hummingbird feeders as well. Um, cavity nesters, okay? This is a female right there. This is a male. Complete red crest hood this is the female partially. You can see this one using the acorns, hiding the acorns in the palms. Pretty neat whenever you watch birds, I'm telling you. And uh, just a beautiful bird. Um, large hopper, platform feeder, nectar feeder. They'll feed on all. This is another easy bird to attract. Very common bird. And you know, your raptors, don't ignore your raptors. This is why our large oaks and our large trees are very good because our raptors need some place to nest. Once, and I don't know if y'all know this, but once a bird is on its nest, that, that nest is protected, okay? All, bird, all of our native songbirds and birds are protected in the United States. Um, um, and so this is a red shoulder, you know, perchers, they go after this one eating a squirrel and they go after rodents, snakes, and so on. So they perch on a tree, they land down and attack it, and either eat right there or fly away and go with it. Eastern bluebirds, um, Again, this is a, this is a male, um, likes to entice the females through, um, through building a nest. But like I said, the, the bluebirds cannot make their own nest. They depend on other birds. So this is why it's good to, ha to have a, a bluebird house for them because they have so much competition. You'll always see them perched on a power line for whatever reason, but they are these perchers. They do perch and they glide down and they attack their prey. They like open areas, okay? So open field, they're going to do great. This is a female. This is a beautiful female right there on the left. This is a male on the right. Um, Man-made boxes, yeah. So highly recommend you getting some bluebird boxes. It, it's not that hard. And we have some in our neighborhood, but they're using our cavities in our tree. And uh, so this is a this is a, one in our demo demo garden in Bushnell. So they're probably using one of our native trees to to um, to go in. And uh, just um, lastly, I have to show this beauty and we'll call it a day and I'll answer some questions. So for your grasses um, and seed loving plants. So some of, you, some of your birds will feed on the ground such as your palm warblers, which I just went through. Um, yellow rump warblers. This is a male painted bunting. This is a female painted bunting. So you can see how um, they're different color, but this is one of our most beautiful birds that we have. Not very big, but this is a ground. This is a bird that likes to sit on the edge of grasses and feed on the grass seed or on the ground eating grass seed. So these native grasses that we have um, are very, very important um, for little for little critters such as this. And if you're lucky, you know maybe you'll get one of these visit your landscape. This is at Circle B Landscape in uh, in Polk County, and of course your cardinals. Always very, one of the easiest birds to attract to a garden. This is the male, this is a female. And uh, again, uh, they'll feed on safflower, crack corn, millet, and so on. So, um, oh, I have to end with this real quick and we'll take questions. Sometimes bird feeding birds is not a good thing. Um, it, it, it's not legal to intentionally feed a sandhill crane. And you better not do it because the sandhill cranes can become a pest. And we've seen this in the villages. So people are feeding birds or feeding sandhills. And whenever they stop feeding them or the bird seed runs out, the sandhills are like, okay, it's feeding time. Where's my food? They're pretty aggressive. So they start poking holes in the screen or on their cars. Um, and then people say, what can I do about it? I'm like, there's nothing you can do about it. This is a protected species, stop feeding the bird. Um, but uh, other than that, you know, our sandhills are just beautiful, wonderful creatures. 
um, leave them be, you know, don't feed them. Don't feed these animals. Um, feed our little songbirds is, is good enough, okay? So this is, um, ba -ba -ba. oh, there's our little red ruby-throated hummingbird going after a firebush, little tiny feet. So um, you just have to be patient with hummingbirds. They're gonna go back and forth, back and forth. So here's that feeder watch, get the bird. It'll tell you, uh, you know, blue jay, whatever. And it's gonna tell you what he eats and what kind of feeder. So cannot say enough about the Cornell Lab. Absolutely wonderful website. Here's my uh, email. Um, and Emily and Jennifer, I don't know how you wanna do this. If you want me to email you my presentation or people can email me, it uh, doesn't really matter. Um, um, if they could email you, that would be great. Good, you can email me, I'll send a PDF. And as I tell everyone, please, 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 if I don't respond to you in a couple of days, send me another email. I get several hundred emails a day. Uh, uh, this this uh, presentation has also been recorded. Oh, good. And can be found on our website under uh, resources and then homeowner, web, homeowner webinars. Good. So um, you can find it there uh, probably in about a couple of weeks. It'll take me to get up. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so feel free to send any questions and uh, or, you know, if y'all have pictures of birds and want ID or just want to share pictures of birds, I love it. You know, send, send, send your stuff. I love to take a look at that kind of stuff. So if y'all have any questions, um, just please shoot them in the chat box or Q&A. Um, let's see, we have a couple. Um, would you recommend a Southern Magnolia or a Little Gem Magnolia? Well, it depends on the site. You know, a Southern Magnolia can get 100 foot tall. A little gem usually gets 30 to 40 foot tall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, if you have the size property, I would say go, go for the Granite Floor. I think it's a beautiful tree. We have several in our Denver garden. If, okay. not, go, if not, go with a little gem. But again, don't plant it too close to your house. Make sure mm -hmm. you space it out and give it some room. Yeah. Uh, outside hose is not potable. Do I use water, uh, bottled water, or is that not necessary? So um, I'm, I'm thinking this is from the bird bath yeah, section. Um, depending on where you live, I know uh, off, if the waters, if, if you have a spigot offside of your house, that water is potable. Um, so you can use that. Um, but I, I would, I would, I would rather, if it was my, it, if it was my recycle irrigation were not potable, that's right, Emily. So I would use a uh, just a jug of water. Like I said, do you want to drink recycled water? <laughs> I don't. So uh, neither do you birds. Just give them some fresh water. Okay. Uh, what seed is the painted bunting, bunting's primary diet? She, she they, missed they it when feed, you said it. They, they feed on all assortment of native grasses. Anything that the seeds and stuff like that. Um, all just an assortment of different plants that seed out. It's not really one little different species, but they will actually, if you go on Cornell, they'll actually tell you what painted buntings prefer, what kind of seed they prefer, and what kind of bird feeder they prefer as well. Because you don't necessarily have the native grasses. You, you can attract them using your bird feeder for sure. And you may get lucky, get some indigo buntings as well. Okay. Uh, I think you've answered this, but what is your opinion on leaving dead trees in the yard? Um, if, if you can, yeah, sure. I love it. Leave, leave your dead trees in the yard. I have five, you know, my family has five acres in Zephyr Hills. I always used to leave brush piles, anything standing and, and I just mowed around it because it, it made a great home for different insects and arthropods, but also these brush piles, the birds used. Um, so it, it, it breaks down and improves soil health. So yeah, if, if you can get away with that and, you know, you don't live in a deed restricted community. I say go for it. Okay. And painted um, and painted yes, painted buntings are migratory birds, so they're winter residents here. Okay, great. Uh, what are some good plants to attract quail? Oh, that is a good question. That is a question I don't know. That is a question I don't know. I'd have to look that up okay. for you. So I'm sorry I can't answer that one for you. Let's see here. Did you just answer, do painted buntings migrate? You just answered that one, yes. right? Yes, they're winter residents. Okay. 
Uh, how to attract cedar wax wings? Any fruit bearing plant. <laughs> Hollies, like I said, they, I've seen them visit the sable palms when they're fruiting out. Um, you know, uh, are you going to be lucky enough to attract cedar wax wings <laughs> when they come down? You know, it's, uh, it's, it's hit or miss with them. But any plant that produces fruit, the cedar wax wings are going to go to. Will you attract cedar wax wings? It's hard to say. Okay. Depends if they're, it depends if they're going to be predominant in that area or not. Uh, okay. Could you repeat? This is our last question. Could you repeat uh, what you mentioned about rats and birds? Yeah. At, yeah. Yeah. So this is, you know, rats are rodents squirrels or rodents see how how far a jump a squirrel can jump a rat can jump just as far you know three feet and so whenever you have if you you know your squirrels love the bird seed right well the rats do too and the rat specifically the rat that i'm talking about is um our fruit rat fruit rat roof rat black rat radis radis is what it is and um what they'll do is they'll go in that bird feeder and they'll start, they'll just, you know, live. So for example, my neighbor put a bird feeder out and I was walking one evening late at night and I saw about seven or eight animals moving in the bird feeder. I'm like, wow, that's really late at night to see rat, uh, squirrels because <laughs> usually diurnal mm -hmm. and uh, got closer and there were about seven to eight roof rats feeding in. And Jennifer, what they did is they went, from my neighbor's yard into my yard. <laughs> now, now, roof rats are typically arboreal, but they will nest in ground. And that's exactly what they were doing. They were nesting under my oak tree. And so in order to do that, we just got rid of the bird feeder. But bird, like I said, it, it's, the, it's the thing that you, are you willing to risk it? For me as a homeowner, I don't want to risk rats getting into my house. I just don't. But some homeowners are okay with that. Some homeowners will actually remove the bird feeder at night or before nighttime. Mm -hmm. um, some will scrape up the bird seed on the ground. That helps. Um, cats aren't that good of a ratter, um, contrary to belief. But um, yeah, it, it's just personal preference. But for me, I don't want anything to attract rats in my house. Okay. Um, we have two questions. I, th I know that was going to be the last one, but um, how do birds use brush piles? Excellent. That's an excellent question, Ronald. So, so your brush pile can be mixed of different, you know, be oak leaves and limbs or whatever. What? Not all birds will utilize this, but certain birds will, especially Carolina wrens or uh, cardinals. And what they'll do is they'll use that as cover and nesting and also to get food. So all a brush, think of it, all of a brush pile is, is just a shorter version of a shrub. You know, um, it's just gonna offer a lot of protection. And whenever a brush pile will, um, it's, like a, it's like a mini compost pile too. So it will generate, so it will offer some protection against the winter elements. Um, so it, it's, it's wonderful to put out. I, I have had brush piles and it's just, you know, it's, and really, Elizabeth, it's a brush pile is a brush pile, you know, start stacking some limbs on top of each other. And it is what it is. The birds will start using it. I don't think there's any technique to a brush pile, just stacking stuff on top of each other. Well, that'll get you, that'll get you started. Great. Uh, I just had one point. Um, you mentioned bottle brush. Uh, weeping bottle brush is now on the um, high risk, high invasion risk. Uh, list from assessment, UF assessment. Is it now really? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So we can't, we can't <laughs> recommend that one. No but bottle brush, the list changes so much. It I does. It changes all the time. So it's I'll good. I'll delete that. It's... I'll delete that slide and cut down my bottle well, brush. Well, <laughs> regular bottle, regular bottle brush is okay. Just yeah. weeping bottle brush. Um, and if anybody has a question about what's invasive and what's not, you can go to uh, assessment.ufl.edu and um, type in either the scientific name or the um, common name and you'll get an answer to uh, whether it's invasive in North, South or Central Florida. Yeah. So um, 
that wraps up our uh, presentation today. Jim, thank you so much. We've gotten a, a bunch of messages saying how informative and how much people have liked your talk today. Excellent, so. thank you. If you. Like I said, any any requests for the presentation, any questions that we didn't answer, please send it to me and, uh, and I'll try to get those answered for you. And thanks Great. Jennifer and Emily for the invitation. I appreciate thank it. Thank you, no problem. They, we appreciate you um, coming on and talking. All right. um, have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.